So in this video, we're going to be hopping from ZBrush to Cinema 4D and rendering in Redshift. In order to do that, if this is your first time, uh, we need to set up just a few things. So uh, I'm, in, I'm in Cinema 4D R26.013, and we're going to go over here to Extensions, Go ZBrush, and hit this Go Z install. That'll install all the necessary files for GoZ to basically send a file from ZBrush straight into Cinema 4D without even really needing to do much else other than hitting a button. Uh, back in ZBrush, uh, you have, here's my GoZ options here underneath my tool menu. Uh, you can go in here to Preferences GoZ uh, if you need to like force reinstall or update any paths. And you can also hit this R key uh, to reset the selected GoZ application. So right now, if I hit GoZ, it's going to send the selected subtool over to Cinema 4D. If I do all, of course, it's going to send all my visible, uh, all my subtools, and then visible is going to be my visible subtools. There is a caveat, though. You're going to see, uh, it's actually two things. Number one, if I alt tap this bottle here, and then we go over here to geometry, uh, dynamic, if we do uh, shift D or turn this dynamic button off, you're going to see this is my actual geometry. Uh, when I'm doing sub D modeling, I like to see what a preview would look like. So I can hit D for a sub D preview, but then shift D to get that back to my actual uh, object. So if I was to send this over now, or if I was to go over here to tool export and export this as an FBX, that would export all of my uh, subtools here. Uh, it would just be getting a low res version. So to fix that, I'm gonna go over here to Z plugin. Uh, there's a clean tool utility you can download and install uh, that you can go down here and say dynamic subdivision to actual subdivisions for all of uh, your subtools. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit that. And again, it's gonna go through all my subtools and convert all of my subdivisions to dynamic subdivision, or all of my dynamic subdivisions to real subdivisions. So now I have real geometry here. Now, if I was to hit go Z right now, if I was to go up here and say export FBX, it would export fine. It would export all my high res stuff, assuming underneath subtool here, you can say all high and it'll go to your highest and then export your highest. However, go Z, the, how it's set up is when you hit GoZ by default, it wants to drop to the lowest, send you to an external application. You can do all your modeling in there, hit GoZ, you can kind of, it'll shove it back into ZBrush and then update your model with the subdivisions, uh, with your high-res subdivisions, with any changes you made on the low-res. It's a very cool feature, but in our case, uh, not, not what I'm looking to do. I want to export all my high-res as well. In order to do that, uh, there's a Z plugin and there's a Z repeat it. Um, now you could use Z repeat it to convert all your dynamic subdivisions to real subdivisions as well. Because all it is is that it basically an action script recorder like Photoshop has. So basically you see a record new. So all I need to do is hit this delete lower while I'm recording. So for instance, hit record new, hit that delete lower button. And then when you hit that and then hit end record, uh, it'll ask you to name it. And then when you're done with that, you'll have something in here called, for example, delete lower. So when you choose that one, you can say, run delete lower on my selected visible or all i'm going to go ahead and say delete lower subdivisions on all of my subtools and now you're going to see it's gone through and deleted all my lower subdivisions so no matter what i send over with go z right now it's going to be my highest subdivision geometry so let's send it on over to cinema 4d uh, i'm going to go up here again to go z and i'm going to hit all and it's only going to take a few seconds it's going through all my subtools here we'll switch over to cinema 4d and you'll see it populate and our objects tab over here will fill up with a bunch of objects from ZBrush. There we go. And then we're going to rotate around. And we have our file ready to render. Uh, right, real quick, I'm going to go up here to File, Save Project. And I'm just going to throw this on my desktop for now. Call it Ship. And let's talk about rendering. So let's look at our render settings. You can go to the Render menu, and there's a Edit Render Settings right here. Or there's a handy little button right here along the top. And if you hover over this, you can see the hotkey for that is Control-B. And here's our render settings. Um, by default, it's set to renderer standard. I'm going to switch this to the Redshift renderer. And now we have Redshift options. So if you click Redshift, uh, you're going to have basic and advanced. And that's important if you want to go and change, you know, like AOV settings and stuff. So basic, advanced, and Redshift renderer. You may see in other videos uh, talking about node spaces. You can find that under renderer node spaces. And you can shift uh, that from current, which is Redshift, to... Um, standard physical or redshift. I'm just going to click redshift. But by default, when you choose the redshift renderer, it should put you in the redshift node space. Now to see us rendering in redshift, uh, you can go up here to your viewport and you can say redshift and start IPR and it will literally just render your viewport using redshift. So you can, you know, tumble around and select objects in here. Uh, what I prefer to do is I'm going to turn off IPR. We're going to go here to window way down here in Redshift Render View, that'll pop up a new window in here. And if you want to dock it, you can grab these three lines and just put it in your interface. We'll just shove it over here to the right. 
And in order to fire it up, uh, once again, you notice this little play sign when we hit the Redshift Start IPR. That's exactly what this is. This is going to start your interactive photorealistic rendering, your IPR renderer. And now when I move my viewport around because it's set to render view and I just have a default camera, as I rotate this, you'll see it update in the Redshift renderer. Now right here, you're going to see the RT, the real time. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a faster uh, results, uh, but it might have a few problems with some of the render settings you might be using. Um, I don't really need to use it, so I'm just going to go ahead and keep that off, but it's there if you need it. And let's start setting our scene up. So I'm going to go up here to create light, and we're just going to throw a dome light into our scene. And this is going to be like a big dome with an image on it, and that image is going to light our scene for us. Of course, you can always go in here and create more lights. There's um, all sorts of lights in here you can choose from uh, and keep adding them to your scene. Uh, but for now, I'm going to click on the dome light here in our objects tab. And you're going to see there's a slot for a texture. So let's load in an HDR image. Uh, you can find some in the content browser. So in here, the uh, sorry, the asset browser, you can do Shift F8, or you can click this little button. And if you just do a search in here for say HDR, uh, first you're going to see these. These are materials with HDR images assigned to them. So if you wanted to use a physical renderer with a physical sky and you know plop those materials in there, you can do that. Uh, but we're not going to be doing that. We're going to be scrolling down here until you see these HDR images. Um, in fact, when I do a search for HDR, you're going to see we have some HDR folders in here. So if I do HDR and double click that, you're going to see by default, you have some textures, HDR uh, images in here. And if you want to grab, grab one, you see the little cloud icon, you can click that and download it. And then once you've done that, you can just grab this HDR image and drop it right on that texture slot. That's going to render our scene now with that HDR image. And if I'm going to rotate that, just click the dome light and then hit R on your keyboard and you can just rotate this dome light around and that'll update your lighting on your object. Now that we can see a little bit better, let's talk about what all of this stuff means over here in the, the Objects tab. So by default, when we use GoZ or when you import an object, it's probably gonna import with its own material. So every single one of these has a material assigned to these objects. If you want to, you can go over here to Window, Material Manager. I'm just gonna keep this docked right in the middle here. So I got a bunch of materials all assigned to these objects. Well, I'm gonna be replacing these materials with uh, Redshift materials, and I really don't need them. So if I want to delete them, just hold down Shift and select them all, hit Delete on your keyboard. Now, it's not gonna delete the materials, it's just gonna delete the assignment of those materials. So the materials are still alive over here. But in my Material Manager, I can right click in here and just say Delete Unused. And if they're not assigned anything, which since I deleted them off of the tags, they're not being used anymore, they'll just be deleted out of your scene. Uh, so speaking of tags, that's what these things are, these little icons out here. Uh, for instance, this is our Fong tag. So let's go ahead and zoom way in on this cork uh, here. And if I choose the cork here, this is our cork object and it's got some properties. If I click this icon right here, this is our Fong attribute. And this is, this is controlling our, uh, it's got our shading angle. So if I drop this down to zero, you're gonna see it's gonna pick up all this faceting over here. And then as I move this up, it's gonna be less and less and uh, until it, you know, it's got a pretty sharp angle here still. Uh, however, if I crank this all the way over to say 180 degrees, it's gonna soften all those normals. So for the cork uh, and for the glass, I'll go ahead and select that too. So here's my glass jar, select that fong angle. I'm just gonna crank that up to 180. That'll ensure that everything's nice and soft and smooth, uh, especially for things with reflections. Uh, I'm not going to be messing with the falling angle for any of these other objects, but it's there if you need it. Uh, these are cool. So these are our face groups. So if you, uh, for example, we have the cork here and we turn on the, uh, select the face group, you're going to see it looks like a bunch of different colors. Well, if we go back into ZBrush, alt tap our cork here and turn on polyframe, you're going to see those are our poly groups that we sent over. So if you needed to use your poly groups for anything in Cinema 4D, you can. Um, I don't need them for anything. So I'm just going to, again, shift, select them and delete them out of our scene. Uh, this one, if you hover over it, it's our vertex color tag. It's our poly paint. So when we're in ZBrush and we're painting on our object, we're painting on the verts. And when we send that over, that's vert color information. Uh, and it's tagged with the name of poly paint. Um, and then right here is UVs. I'm not using any UVs on this. We're just going to use some triplanar nodes to do our texturing for us. So we're just going to go ahead and select all those and delete them. Now let's talk about visibility in Cinema 4D so I can talk about polypaint real quick. So inside of this jar, there's a ship with a bunch of different things on here. Um, in order to turn off this glass jar, if we just select the glass jar and we are in the basic tab, you're gonna see there's editor visibility and renderer visibility. Um, there's default on and off. And that's what these little dots do. So if you click this top one, that's going to set your editor visibility to on, off, and default. So you just cycle through those three. Uh, same thing for this. This is your renderer visibility, default on, off, 
or uh, default and if you hold on alt you can click through all those three um, all those at once so i'm just going to double tap this one with alt held down and that will turn off the visibility for our glass jar in the editor and in the renderer so now i can see the ship and i can see the ship has a sail so with this sail selected you can select it in your viewport here you can go over here and you can touch the poly paint, poly paint <laughs> tag attribute and you can see it's vertex colors uh, and it'll actually show up in your viewport but it's not showing up in our renderer so let's fix that uh, i'm going to click this little plus sign well if you hold this down uh, by default it makes a new default material you can go into here to materials and create any type of material you'd like uh, but in our case since we're in the redshift mode if we just click this it's going to make a redshift material in order to assign it to something you can either drag and drop it onto your viewport and it'll make it onto the sail or you can drag and drop it over here onto the object and you'll see a little material icon uh, pop up so now the redshift material is on the sail and it's showing up in our render which is great and if you just click the material you're going to get a bunch of properties in here um, and here's your basic properties if you double click this material you're going to get uh, same thing you're going to get the base properties uh, all right here which is all right here as well um, and then all the stuff that's kind of in little tabs over here the sss encoding you have that right here you can go through here uh, what i want to bring your attention to though is this node editor button right here so we can click this node editor button we're going to close this down and i'll move this here and we'll move this up so now we have our redshift material and then our output onto our surface and I need a way to bring this poly paint into this material and pipe it on uh, through. How I'm going to do that is by adding a node and there's, you can go up here and you can click this plus sign and that'll bring up this little node window. Um, as soon as you tap off of it, it disappears. If you want to keep it around you click plus sign and then this little pin icon. And then when you click off, it'll stick, stick around. Um, but you can also just hit C on your keyboard and that'll just bring this window up temporarily. So if we do a search for vertex you see there's a vertex attribute you can just click and drag that into your node space and then now we have a vertex attribute there's nothing plugged into this now but you see there is a space for an attribute name so all i need to do is underneath a sail um, i'm again i'm using this poly paint so with a vertex attribute selected take the sail poly paint just drag it on there and essentially it's just going to it's going to type in for you poly paint with a capital p and that's the attribute name it's looking for now I'm going to take the out color for this vertex attribute and we're going to put this into the diffuse color. And there we go, it's been updated and uh, now we have a really shiny uh, sail. Um, in this node editor, if you'd like, uh, you can also touch these three icons right here if you want to kind of shrink these things down. Uh, and also this big icon right here is just this texture button. So if you don't need to see the preview of the shader ball, you can turn that off. So you, uh, you also see an S a key that'll show you just the vertex attribute and then if you turn that off it'll show you the entire material piped all the way through so it's basically a way to solo what this node is showing you so you see it's just a flat color we turn solo off and now it's the color with all the material attributes past that uh, so there we go we've got a sail in here um, if we ever want to update this material again all you got to do is again just select it over here and go down here to say reflection roughness and we'll just crank this up because it's cloth it won't be so shiny and now we have a sail with vertex color and a redshift material. Let's go ahead and double click this so we can rename it as sail. And another thing I want to do, if I go down so you can see the bottom of the ship, you see how it kind of just seems like it's floating in air. It's not really grounded. If you were using the physical renderer, you could go in here to create environment and there'd be a floor plane you could create. Uh, but instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go in here to create mesh primitives. And we're just going to grab a plain old plane. And drop it into our scene now we have a plane in here you're going to see it's right up top so let's go ahead and i'm going to middle mouse click this view over here and we'll go ahead and turn off our content browser and then from the side view here let's go ahead and take this plane and move it down so it's just at the bottom of the ship and then i'm going to middle mouse click here so now we have a plane in our scene that's at t and i'm going to scale this way up and it's going to catch all of our shadows so we have a plane underneath our ship and that ship is casting shadow so as we again rotate this dome light around all the shadows that are happening are going to fall on that plane. So let's make this plane a basically a, just a shadow catcher. So it'll show us our shadows, but then just get rid of all the other uh, parts of the plane that aren't shadows. So how we're going to do that is we're going to take this plane here. Uh, you can go in here to tags, render tags, and make a redshift uh, object, or you can right click on any object in here. Uh, that'll bring up this menu, and then again, render tags, redshift object. So now this plane has a redshift object tag. We're going to say override 
We're going to go here to the mat option. We're going to say override, enable it. And uh, underneath shadow, we're going to go ahead and enable that as well. So now again, uh, the plane disappears, but we still look at those awesome shadows. So as we rotate our dome light around, there's our shadow catcher at work. Problem is, if we hold down Alt and turn our glass jar back on, and we zoom out just a bit, let's go ahead and make this glass jar glass. Uh, so we're going to hit the plus sign again. That makes us a new redshift material. Drag that redshift material onto the object here. And then if with this redshift material selected, go over here to the preset and just choose glass. There it goes. Now, again, the problem is the glass looks like it's full of milk. You know, you see a big white splotchy area in here. And that is, if we go back to the plane, redshift object, matte options. Underneath the general, go ahead and say apply to secondary rays. That way so we still get the shadows, but we can also see through our glass. All right, everything's coming coming along here. So let's go ahead and uh, texture this cork. Uh, if we head back over to the content browser and we do a search for cork, you're going to see we have a cork material, which is awesome. So I'm going to click and drag that right onto our object here. Uh, this isn't necessarily a redshift uh, material, but it will attempt to render it uh, as as you would expect. Uh, but I am going to say this, uh, select this material, go in here to the arrow material tools, and I'm going to convert materials. So I have the cork with the material on it. And if I take this redshift cork that we just made or converted and drag that onto my cork, um, you're going to see we now have two materials on here. So I need to delete this material assignment off of there. And then of course I can right click in here and say delete unused materials. And now I just have the redshift cork assigned to this. Again, I don't have UVs on this object, so I'm just going to use triplanar nodes to texture this. So let's double click this. And this is a little bit of a different node view. So if I put this over here, this is the redshift shader graph. So when I have this material selected, you can hit edit shader graph or just double click it and you'll get this view right here. Super useful view. And just like the other shader graph, we have a material node, we have an output to the surface node, and then we have a bunch of textures, you know, pumped into our material. Um, let's go ahead and make a triplanar node. There's a couple different ways to do this. And this view here, hit shift C in order to bring this up. In fact, when you're in, uh, let's say you're over here, you know, messing around in your object tab. If you hit Shift C over here, this is going to be a command uh, search. So you can just search for commands in here. And then in the Redshift editor node, same deal. Shift C in here will be a find nodes. And then we can just type in triplanar. You can click and drag it in here. Alternatively, you can also hit Tab and then start typing in triplanar. Planer, and it'll even tell you, hey, it's under Utilities, Triplanar. So you can hit Tab, and that'll take you straight to that search. Anyway, so we have a Triplanar node here. So I'm going to take my Diffuse color, pump it into the Triplanar. I'm going to put it under Texture, Image, X. And the reason I'm doing that is because, by default, the Triplanar node is going to have the same image on each axis checked on. Uh, so if I pump it into the X, it's going to apply it to the X, Y, and Z uh, coordinates. So it's basically going to planar project my texture on all sides of the object. Now, in order to see what this is doing, uh, I can take this and I can put it right onto my surface. So now this is what our triplanar node is looking like. And then I want to, you know, put my RS material back on here. I can do that. Obviously, that gets a little bit annoying and time consuming. Um, and where that functionality can be found is underneath tools, connect node to output. So instead of doing that manually, you can just select this and say tool, connect node to output. And then I can go back down here and say tool, connect node output. And it's still, that's kind of slow and clunky. So you're going to see uh, we have a hotkey for that. And how you can assign that is underneath window, customization, command manager. Uh, and then again, we'll do a search for connect node output. You can select it. Uh, with that selected, just do your shortcut combo, whatever you want to make that. I made it shift V and then I hit assign. Uh, and then we're good to go. So when you come back in here, you'll see it's assigned to Shift V. So very quickly, I can say Shift V, Triplanar, Shift V, Material. And that's the result I'm going to get. So again, with Triplanar selected, underneath Coordinates, you're going to see there's a scale. And if I stretch this out, you're going to see it actually has three values. And I certainly don't want to have to type in the same number three times while I, you know, tab over. So to make this a little bit easier, I'm going to go over here to the Math area. I'm going to drag in a Constant node. Uh, and by default, the triplanar is set to 0.1, or, or I'm sorry, the scale is set to 0.01. So we'll go ahead and say, you know what? You were set to 0.01. I'm going to drag this into the triplanar node. We're going to say coordinates scale. So this constant value is going to control all three of the scale values. 
So if I want to change this to say 0 0.0015, it'll update all three at the same time. And then I can just use this node to control uh, the scale. Now, if I want it, uh, so if I hold down shift and move these nodes out of the way, um, if I want to have a triplanar node on the bump map as well, which I probably do, I'm gonna hold down control, uh, drag out a copy of this triplanar node. I'm gonna take the bump out and again to image X and then out color into the bump input and then the constant into the scale. And now uh, the bump and the diffuse We'll have the same triplanar settings and the same scale settings. And then we'll take our RS material node. We'll do shift V so that that's the output. And then for this color, we'll go ahead and pump that into the diffuse. So now we have our bump and diffuse and cork as a redshift material. We've learned a couple different nodes and everything's looking pretty good. So now really, uh, you know, we got some wood we need to put on here and maybe we want to put some thumbprints uh, on the glass here. And if we go into our content browser, we can do a search for wood. Uh, if we scroll way down here, there's some wood materials you can choose from. Um, however, if I go in here and say like grunge and stuff, maybe there's some grunges in here, but I do know where I can find some thumbprints. So if I head over into Substance Painter, um, I can go in here to grunge. And if we turn this off, we're gonna see here's all of our grunges. I'm gonna do grunge print. And here is some uh, thumbprint grunges. Now, there's two ways to get stuff out of Substance Painter and make it usable uh, in Redshift uh, for rendering. And if I right click this, I can export this resource, but that's gonna export this as an SBSAR. Well, let me just show, show you both ways to do this. So for the wood, type in wood here, I'm gonna go in here to uh, just wood, American cherry, right click, export resource. We're just gonna throw this right onto our desktop say select folder and that's going to export an SBSAR, which if you're not familiar, that's a substance archive file. It has a bunch of different nodes put together to create, uh, generate wood textures, but it's not just texture maps. If we just want texture maps, what we can do is we go in here to file, open sample, double click the tiling material. We're going to get rid of all these layers here. We can just put on a fill layer and in this fill layer, we can go back to our grunge print, and we can just take this grunge and drop it onto our base color. So if I go in here to File, Export Textures, again, we'll just throw this right onto our desktop here. I'm gonna go in here to this default material area, and I'm just gonna export one texture, and that's gonna be where I put my grunge map, which is in my base color. If you were really texturing this, if you're going to Substance Painter and doing a beautiful job texturing and you wanted to export um, your, all your textures as images to render in Redshift, you can do that. You can go in here to the output templates and there is templates set up uh, for Redshift, Redshift material and named. Uh, but in our case, we're just getting images out of here and then dumping them into the renderer. So having said all that, we got that one selected. Let's go over here and just say export. And on our desktop, that's going to put a PNG of that grunge image. Now, if you wanted to, you could go in here, say to wood. I'm just going to click wood and that's going to fill the fill layer here. You can go in here to file, export textures. You could, you know, say, oh, I want a 2048 uh, with my color roughness and normal. And then you could export those as images. Uh, but instead, I'm going to use the, like I said, the SBSAR for this. So let's hop out of Substance Painter. And just to show you where those are. So here's my SBSAR file. And then there's my PNG of my grunge. So that's what I'm going to be dropping into uh, Cinema 4D to do some more texturing. So speaking of grunge, let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit on this glass here. And just so we can see this a little bit better, I'm gonna go into our dome light and I'm gonna temporarily turn off our background for our environment. So if we go into our glass material, let's go ahead and double click this and name this bottle. Let's double click it. And by default, it's gonna be set up with this node editor like we had for our sale. Um, if you want the other node editor, what you can do is you can again go in here to material tools, convert materials. We can drop this Redshift RS bottle on here. And then again, we get rid of the other bottle assignments and we can go ahead and say right click, delete unused nodes. And if we double click this now, now we have our Redshift settings. 
So if I take that grunge texture and just drag it into our nodes, you'll see we now have our grunge in here. And I want this grunge to affect, if we drag it over the blue section, I'm gonna put it into the refraction roughness here. And you're gonna see it already gets, you know, really smudgy, uh, but let's see what's making it smudgy. So if I go back here, uh, like in the other viewer, you can hit S to make this. Again, we have Shift V, which is gonna put this into the output node. And now you can see, here's that smudgy texture. Now, if I go through here and I go to general UV, we do have scale in here, but we got two uh, numbers to change. So of course that's too much work. We're gonna go down here to math, drop in our constant, and then we're just gonna pump this into our UV scale. And then we'll set this to one, and then there we go. If we wanna tile this more, or we can just put it up to like three. Um, you could do a triplanar node. This is gonna be a pretty subtle effect, so I'm not too concerned about that. But essentially this is what's causing some of the areas to be rough and then some of the areas to be shiny. So the dark areas are shiny, the white areas are rough. So if I go back to the artist material, shift V, you're gonna see uh, that's the result we get. Now, if we wanna make it so that the white areas are really rough or the black areas are really shiny, uh, how we can control that is with a ramp. So again, I can either hit shift C in here or hit tab and then type in ramp. And then you'll see there's a ramp node we can drag in here. And it's gonna be kind of like a levels where if we take this uh, texture and we put it out to uh, this ramp here, and then the out color of the ramp into the refraction roughness, this gradient right here will control how much of the white shows up and how much of the black shows up. To see this a little bit better, let's do Shift V so we can see the output of this ramp. And uh, nothing looks like it changed at all. However, if we take this white and drag it to the left, you're gonna see the whites get very white and they uh, start overtaking some of the grays. Uh, same thing with the black, they'll start getting very dark and overtaking some of the whites. And then if you take this middle node here, you can put more values towards the black or allowing, we're allowing more black uh, into the texture. So it's making it overall darker and then overall lighter just by changing this mid value here. So with that uh, knowledge, let's go hit Shift V, and then now we can go back to our ramp. And while we're looking at this view, we can go through and change this to be you know, very smudgy or not very smudgy, depending on the look you're going for. And also while we're in here, let's go into RS Material and uh, underneath Reflection, or I'm sorry, Refraction Color, let's make this a, this is a very slight green tint for our jar there. All right, so we'll go ahead and close that out and we'll go back into our dome light and we'll turn our background back on. Now let's talk about uh, that wood that we exported from Substance. So I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna hold down Alt and I'm gonna turn off our glass jar and our cork. And we're gonna zoom in a little bit and uh, let's apply some wood to the ship. Now, in order to get it in here, uh, probably the best way is go in here to Extensions substance engine and say substance asset manager and this is where you can load up all sorts of substance uh, sbsar files uh, you can go in here to file load and uh, we just have one on our desktop so let's double click that and you'll see it's in here um, by default it creates a material for you but you can also right click in here and say create standard metallic or glossy materials uh, just with this so we can just click and drag this uh, let's put it on the side here there you go. And like, just like before with the cork, it'll render whatever you're, whatever you have in here. It'll try to render to the best of its abilities. Uh, but what I'm going to do is again, click this, go in here to material tools, and we're going to convert this material, drag this redshift wood on here, and we'll delete that duplicate assignment and then right click delete unused materials. Now, before we head in there, let's go ahead and make a new one just real quick. And again, one more time, material tools, convert. Uh, on this RS materials, we're going to get that big redshift node graph again. If you take this and you just drag it in here, it'll actually go through and connect all this for you. So here's your output node and your material and all your textures. You probably don't need all of these, but again, it will connect them all for you uh, just with a default material. Uh, however, if you delete these out of here, I'm just going to double click this and you'll see it also when we created it and converted it, uh, it went ahead and connected these for us too. So let's go ahead and take a look through this node graph. The displacement, I don't really need. Um, I'm not doing anything that fancy, so we can go ahead and get rid of those. And then uh, for the diffuse color, I'm just gonna go rearrange some of this. Here's our diffuse. I'm gonna hold down shift and we're gonna move this to the top. And then here's these ones. We're gonna move it to the bottom. And there we go. So we've got this all 
organized. And just like the other uh, materials we've been looking at, we have our output and our material node here. And then we got a bunch of textures from our SBSAR that are in here. So if you click on these, you can see here's the wood. Um, and in fact, here's the, the reflection and the wood are using the same material. And in fact, I don't even need that texture to control that. So we'll simplify this even more. So there we go. Now you can see in this instance, uh, it looks pretty decent uh, in this case, but uh, if we take this wood and in fact, let's just rename it. Name it wood horizontal. If we drag this onto our top here, you're gonna see that really it would be nice if this wood, uh, we could change direction of this wood. So it's not gonna work uh, in every situation. And because it's not a triplanar, uh, node, we're kind of just at the mercy of however this is being projected in our object. So let's go ahead and we'll go ahead and make this triplanar. So we'll go ahead and like we did before, we can hit shift C, put in a triplanar node here. Again, texture image X. And if we want to see this shift V, we see this is the result we're getting. The default scale value is 0.01. Uh, again, if we want to control that scale, that's underneath that math constant. Drag that in. Coordinates, scale, and we'll set this to 0.01. And that's pretty much the value I want. If you want to change it, you know, that's how you change the scale. Uh, of course, we want to apply this to all the other textures. So I'm going to go ahead and take this and we'll put this into our diffuse color. And then with the material, we'll Sit shift V so we can see that the output. And then again, control, drag out the triplanar node, and then we'll take the roughness into image X, and then the output into the reflection roughness, and then the constant controlling the scale. And then control, drag this out. And then again, the bump into image X, the scale from the constant, and then the out color into the bump. So now all of these are being controlled uh, by this one scale, and it's all triplanar. So Again, if we go to the top here and we put this on the top, looks better since it's in triplanar mode now. So you can actually see the wood grain. But again, that wood grain is rotated in the wrong direction. Uh, so we'll undo that and we'll make another version of this material so we can use it in more places. In fact, uh, we can take this horizontal. I'm going to put it here. And I'm just going to go through and see if we can't just put some of these things on these surfaces and have it work. Um, now for the top, if we need to have it rotated in a different direction, again, um, if you want to make a copy of a material, just control drag it in here, just like we were doing with the triplanar node earlier. And we'll call this wood vertical. We'll go in here and we're going to put some rotation ability within this new copy of the material that we have. So if you go into the triplanar node, you can see we do have a rotation that has three values. And it's not going to be like the constant where I want one number to control all three. I might need one number for here and a different number for this one and a different number for this one. So in order to do that, I'm going to go here to math vector, just drop in a vector ABS node. And so this is set to 0, 0, 0, uh, which is the default value for the triplanar. So if we connect this one here into the blue and we're going to tell it coordinates rotation, and we'll just do that for all three triplanar nodes. So now if I take this wood vertical and drop it on here, uh, again, you get the same result. However, now we have uh, control over this. So if we select this and we just start clicking and dragging, X doesn't seem to be doing much. Y is actually rotating it, so that's great. We'll do Y here and then Z, uh, good. So we'll do Y and Z set at 90. And we'll put X back to zero. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can discuss this. With the triplanar node selected, there's a blend amount. So you can go through here and you can kind of blur how, when these, where these textures cross over and then also a blend curve uh, to control. So you can go through here and kind of just blur those transitions between uh, those textures if you need to. Uh, so here we have a vertical version and a horizontal version. So we'll go ahead and between these two, just fill out the rest of these, oops. You can just click and drag onto the objects in here. And these trim areas, I'm gonna make metal. Uh, it's gonna be really easy. So we can just click uh, plus, we have a new 
redshift material, if I click and drag that onto this area right here, you're gonna see it's gonna default just to a gray. However, with that material selected, I can go down here to presets, and just like we made the glass, you can make it glass if you want to, um, or we can go in here, and in this case, we're gonna make it copper, um, but I want it to be brass, so let's go ahead and rename this to brass. And in order to make this a little more brassy, we're gonna come down here to reflection, reflectivity, color, and we're going to just make this a little more, just push it over into the yellows a little bit. Uh, now we have a brass and I can just drag and drop this onto all the areas where I might want brass. And for the rope, we can just make that a really basic material. Let's call it rope. We'll come down here to diffuse color and we'll make it, you know, a mid yellow and then underneath reflection roughness. We'll go ahead and crank that up and then drop rope right under a rope here. So everything's basically being given a texture, Oop, except for the portholes. Uh, another really easy one here, we'll call this tinted glass. We'll drop it on here. And again, with that selected, we have a preset that we can make tinted glass. So here's all of our stuff. We'll go ahead and turn on uh, our cork in our glass jar, just alt tap both of these and everything's, uh, everything's back in view. Now let's talk about cameras. So uh, right now I've just been using my default camera and it's being controlled by me and then it's uh, being updated in the Redshift viewer because it's set to render camera. Uh, if we wanna create a camera, all we gotta do is go over here to create camera. You're gonna see two sets. You're gonna see cameras up here and cameras down here and these little dots indicate that it's a Redshift camera. However, if we just create a camera and then we go over here to create camera standard, Redshift camera, See, this is Redshift camera, RS camera, and it's got a Redshift camera tag, and this camera doesn't have a Redshift camera tag. If we click both of these, you're gonna see there's an extra node that pops up right here when we have the Redshift camera selected. Um, however, all you gotta do is go in here to the camera, right click, camera tags, make it a Redshift camera, and now these are both identical. Uh, so we can go and delete this. And in fact, under camera with the Redshift camera node selected, you're going to see camera type and it's got fisheye and cylindrical and stuff. That's all these things are, is just the camera tag selected and then the camera type changed out. So now let's put a little bit of depth of field uh, into our scene here. Uh, one important thing to know is that right now I have this camera selected and I'm moving this viewport around, but the renderer is set to my basically my default camera over here. However, if I set this to camera, that's going to go to my camera that I created. In fact, we'll go ahead and name this render cam so we know what it is. So this viewport is now just my default camera. The renderer is now set to my render cam. However, if I want my viewport to control my render cam, all I gotta do is go over here to render cam, hit this little button here, and that's going to make my viewport control my render cam. So that's totally cool. Uh, but we'll go ahead and kick that back out. So back to focal shift. So with our ca render cam selected, uh, go over here to object and you're going to see there's a focal distance or a focus distance in here and an eyedropper. Uh, you can click the eyedropper and then click over here, uh, for example, if you want to focus uh, distance here and you're going to see my camera, uh, this little orange thing just snapped back. So that's actually controlling my focus distance. So you can either go up here uh, to this view. I mean, you can click middle mouse button if you like, you know, going in from the top view. Just click this little dot here and that's going to control your focus distance. Or, like I said before, you can grab this little eyedropper here and just click on the front, and that's gonna set your focus distance. Now, it's not really doing much, uh, so in order to get see what that's doing, let's go over to the Redshift camera, Bokeh. Uh, we're gonna say Override Enabled, and I need access to the COC radius, so I'm gonna change Derive from Camera to just Focus Distance, and then the COC radius I now have available to me, and I can go ahead and crank that up, and now as I crank this up, you're gonna see the dot I selected for my focus distance is going to be sharp and then everything else is blurry. And again, I can either come over here to the camera and just move this focal distance back so I can focus in the middle or I can go back here to object, click on this little eyedropper and just click and set that. Now you may need to see how it kind of gets a little bit fuzzy. I'm going to go ahead and set this to camera view again. If I just jiggle just a little bit, then it'll kind of kick it in so that it focuses on the right area. But again, sample in here. Now you may be 
and there it is updated. You may accidentally come in here and be like, hey, can I click in here? And, and you can't, it's, it's expecting you to click over here to, to get that to set correctly. However, uh, there is an option for you to do that. If you go through here, since we have a truncated render view, if you click this little two arrows here, you have more options. And one of those options is uh, click to focus. So you can click that on, you can click in the back in your render view and it'll set that render focus uh, in there. In fact, there's also select object and select material in here if you'd like. And in fact, in this dropdown, you can set this to clay and get a nice clay render. Uh, we'll put that back to regular. Now, just so you have enough control, just in case you need to use it, uh, you can go in here to say create null, and we'll call this camera focus. Uh, so if we go back to our render cam, you're gonna see there's a focus distance and a focus object. So you can say uh, focus, camera focus null into that focus object. So if I go back here and let's go ahead and get our camera off of our render view. Now with camera focus selected, if I go through here and I move this around, that null object is going to control our, fo uh, our focus area. So instead of going through and selecting on your camera, you can set it to just an object here. And in fact, if you go to your render cam and you say animation tags target, uh, that'll give it a target tag and then you can take your camera focus and drop it into that target tag. So again, render cam with a target tag created, camera focus, camera focus into your target object. So now if you go in here to your camera focus and you move this around, that's actually going to move the focus and the target of the camera. I don't need to use this myself, but if you need it, it's there for you. But I'm gonna go ahead and delete that out of there. And again, we can just delete that target node. And then we're back to, I'm just gonna middle mouse click here. I'm gonna say, give me control over this view. And now I can go through here and just set this and my focal distance. Now, right now, let's go back to our render cam and I'm going to, I'm going to back off that COC radius just a bit. So we do have a scene and it's kind of set in our view, but it's essentially just that HDR image. Um, I can use that to light my scene, but I can also put a backplate in here. So I'm going to go over here to my content browser and we just do a search for backplate. Uh, you're going to see uh, there's some images down here you can check out. And I also have ZBrush uh, backplates uh, that I have in here, some Pixelogic ones. Uh, just FYI, if you go up here and you right click and you say create category, you can, you know, put in a new category. Uh, you can say you, uh, what category it goes under. So if I want to put it under like backplate ZBrush, I can hit OK. OK. And now under backplate ZBrush, I have a test folder and I can drop anything from my computer into these folders. So just a really quick, easy uh, way to kind of get your content organized. Um, you can do that, but I'll go ahead and delete that out of there. Again, backplate ZBrush, I'm gonna scroll down to where we're just looking at that table. I'm gonna click and drag that into my dome light backplate. I'm gonna go ahead and enable that. And then again, instead of a background environment, we can have a backplate. I'm just gonna drag this image in here. There we go. So now as I move my camera around, I can kind of set this object into this background. And then again, under render cam, you can dial in your, uh, your blur radius here. Oh, one thing I should mention is we talked a little bit about, uh, again, those double arrows over here and you can select the focus. You're gonna see in here, you can uh, click and drag to adjust the distance and then alt drag to adjust the radius. So again, if we crank that up here and we select this and then we alt drag, we can set that, uh, that radius uh, as well on the fly and the distance. So that's kind of cool. But again, I'm gonna take this radius down quite a bit. And we're going to zoom in. I'm going to set my focal distance toward the front here. And let's say I wanted to put a little bit of ambient occlusion uh, on this jar, uh, like under the lid, uh, the lip of that glass there. And you can do that uh, on a per material basis. So for instance, if we go in here to the bottle material, and then we have our nodes here. If I just do a search, so shift C or tab, and we'll go in here to AO, you'll see there's an AO node. And if we wanna see what this node is doing, so here's my jar, and then I've got an AO node. So if I just do shift V on this node, you're gonna see as it's in this material, it's putting an ambient occlusion on this jar. And I can go over here, I can you know change my samples. And if I change this out a little bit, you can see we can change the spread of the AO. 
and then also the fall off if you want to change that. So you can add ambient occlusion to your material. So if I change this where it's supposed to go, which is in your material here, overall, overall color, and then we'll set this back to shift V. It's going to put AO on this jar. However, because it's a glass and it's got interior and exterior surfaces, uh, it's going to be very, very dark because obviously no lights getting in there on the inside. You can kind of play around with this, not that you'd really need to do this, but you can go in here to uh, render tags, make it a redshift object, and then underneath visibility, you can override and you can take off that cast AO. And then again, you can come in here and kind of play around with these settings if you want to kind of change what this AO does. Uh, but again, since that inside is very dark, uh, AO is not going to work in this case. But if you did need this to add AO to any material, uh, that's a great way to do it. But in our instance, uh, it's not really going to be what we're looking for. However, there is a really easy way to comp in uh, an ambient occlusion pass. And of course, most of our, well, all of our passes are going to be controlled by render Redshift AOV manager. And if you remember way back at the beginning of this tutorial, if we click on the render settings uh, with Redshift selected, and then we're under the advanced tab, there's AOV options. And in here is the show AOV manager which is what we just opened. So again, it's either there or render AOV manager. So while we're in here, um, you may be thinking, oh, you can go grab an ambient occlusion and drop it in here. Um, that's not the node we're gonna be looking for. In fact, what we need is a custom node and with custom selected, uh, you can go down here and you can put in a default material. But luckily, Redshift has a really easy default material. So we can go in here to create Redshift Utilities AO, and now we have a Redshift AO material. And if I just take that material and drop it right in here to the default material, now we have an AOV that is named custom, and we'll go ahead and rename this to say like my AO or whatever you want it to be named. And with this, it's using the default AO material. So where do you go to see this? Well, in the Redshift Viewer, Render View, you have Beauty, and now that we've added a AOV, we have another option in here. So we'll go to My AO, and now you see this is rendering out uh, an AO pass along with that Beauty pass. So when I go and save this, it'll save it as a separate image that is just my AO, exactly what I'm looking for. However, it would be nice for me to be able to select just this jar and just this cork. So when I go in and I comp this together, I can have those as two separate masks so I can uh, edit them individually. You can go into, again, your AOV manager. There is a, if you scroll down, an object ID option in here. Um, and it's pretty easy to add object IDs to objects. So uh, for instance, glass jar, uh, we don't need this anymore. We were messing around with that cast AO. We don't need that. So we have all these objects. So I'm going to go ahead and select my cork. And in fact, if we want to organize this a little bit, so you have all these objects here that are all part of the ship, just hit Alt G and that will put them all under a null node. We can double click this and call it ship group. And now when we open this up, everything's all nicely nested underneath there. And now again, if I select cork and then all the way down, hold down shift and select all these, we can right click, go in here to render tags, add a redshift object. Um, and then with all these redshift objects selected, we can go in here to object ID. And if you want to give these all an individual object ID, we can go in here to override. We can say num plus one. And then now when we click through here, you're going to see this is one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Uh, and then that'll give them all unique ma masks. But I'm just taking this into Photoshop. I just need a couple of colors. I don't need everything to have its own. So I'm going to go through here. And I'm going to delete these. And I'm going to show you another option. So in here, instead of an object ID, we're going to go to Puzzle Mat. Drop that in here. And this is uh, very simple. Basically, you have a red, green, and blue ID controlled by a material ID by default. Let's change that down here to object ID. Uh, red, I'm going to set the one. Uh, green, I'm going to set to two. So if I go in here and I say cork, glass jar, just select both of those. Right click, render tags, redshift object. With both of these redshift objects selected, object ID, override. So the cork, I'm going to set to one. And the glass jar, I'm going to set to two. Oops, two. So red and green 
So if I go down here to beauty and I go to uh, the puzzle mat, you're not going to see anything because it needs to be bucket rendered, um, not progressive rendered. So all you need to do is go over here and hit this little bucket rendering icon. And now it's going to go square by square and render. And now you're going to start seeing the green show up for the jar and the red show up for the cork. There you go. And you can get super fancy with these and have it so that it, you know, also gives you a slight color for reflections. Uh, so if you need to go in and change the color of an object, you can do it across the reflections and the object itself. Uh, very, very robust. And again, that's all going to be underneath that Redshift AOV manager. So you can do all sorts of passes in here. Very, very powerful. Uh, if I go back here to beauty, um, to get these passes out of here, uh, one thing I should mention, if we go in here to our render settings, uh, up here under output, this is where you can change your output size and how, how big your renders are and where things save and how they save. But you can also just, while you're in this render view, go up here to File, Save Multi-Layer EXR As. I'm going to drop this on my desktop as ship. And then if I hop into Photoshop, and I drag that ship EXR in there. Uh, I have an EXR IO uh, plugin that's going to open all these for me. And now you see I have my RGB, my AO, and my puzzle mat. So for instance, if I want to just have AO for the glass jar and go in here to channels, choose green, or control click the green channel. I'll come back here to my AO, give it a mask. We'll go ahead and turn that off. So now my AO just goes in the jar area, and then I can set this to multiply. Feel free to change the you know levels or exposure. And then here again, you can just add uh, an exposure. We'll go ahead and Alt Tap to link it. And we'll turn the exposure up a little bit, and then gamma correct it a little bit. And any of the uh, image adjustments that you want to do, uh, you can go ahead and do it in Photoshop. But anyway, I hope that was useful for kind of just a really quick, and again, I don't, I've only been using Redshift for about a day and a half or so. I'm going to go ahead and take it off bucket render. But it is nice to be able to have an option if you are a, uh, a Redshift user to kind of quickly and easily hop from ZBrush, hit a button from GoZ, go right in here to Cinema 4D, do all your setup in here. Uh, if you're a ZBrush user, just another viable alternative and uh, what nodes you need to plug in and how what, what all these things mean uh, in order to get uh, that final image that you're looking for.